Welcome to Season 3 of the Australian Naval History video and podcast series. It is a production of the Naval Studies Group at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, in partnership with the Australian Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, the Submarine Institute of Australia and the Sea Power Centre Australia. I'm Greg Swindon, a former naval officer and a naval historian from the Sea Power Centre Australia. During the Pacific campaign of World War II, the Royal Australian Navy established a large network of shore bases to support a sizeable flotilla of small ships operating in New Guinea waters. This organisation helped enable operations in New Guinea and Borneo, as well as support the Australian squadron in the Philippines campaign. Yet one of the least known chapters in Australian naval history is the RAN's extensive involvement in Papua New Guinea waters from World War II until the country's independence in 1975. Through this period, the RAN maintained its PNG division based at HMAS Tarangau on Manus Island. Its work helped the development of the country and the creation of the maritime element of the Papua New Guinea Defence Force, the PNGDF. As part of the preparations for independence, the Joint Force PNG was established on the 1st of February 1972 with an army, naval and air component, each with its own separate headquarters. One year later, the Joint Force PNG was redesignated as the Papua New Guinea Defence Force with its headquarters HQ PNGDF at Murray Barracks in Port Moresby. All RAN activities in PNG, as well as the Army Landing Craft Squadron and base in Port Moresby, were then fully incorporated into the PNGDF as its maritime element. This is the first of three episodes on the RAN in Papua New Guinea. It looks at the RAN operations in PNG waters from 1945 until the RAN lost its identity as a single service in the PNG in PNG with the establishment of the PNGDF in early 1973. Joining me today, Jerry Latton, who retired from the RAN as a commander at the age of 41 and has had extensive experience ashore and afloat in PNG in both naval and merchant service. Also joining me is Commander Viv Littlewood, who was the XO of HMAS Tarangau during 1972-1973. Dr Tristan Moss, joining us from Brisbane remotely, the author of Guarding the Periphery, the History of the Australian Army in PNG, 1951 to 1975, including the formation of the PNGDF. And finally, Dr. Brian McDonnell, who served as a senior medical officer at HMAS Tarangau for four years from November 1963. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, I'll start off for you, Tristan. Um, could you please set the scene, you know, what was the strategic rationale for basing Australia's armed forces in PNG after World War II and before uh, PNG independence? Well, uh, well, great to be here. Uh, as a historian, my answer is always, it's complex. Um, <laughs> uh, you're, you're all, I'm sure you're all rolling your eyes there. But um, essentially, it goes back to, to the reason we colonised PNG in the 1880s. And, and that is this sense of uh, PNG being a barrier, uh, you know, a, a you know, first line of defence for the Australian mainland. Um, you know, that sort of mountain range that goes through the centre of PNG is very much that the wall that Australia wanted to create um, in the 1880s, um, in, initially against um, Germany, who'd taken over New Guinea. Now, that rationale sort of uh, covered Australia's conception of PNG in a strategic sense right up until World War II. The idea was that PNG was to be held lightly, um, and, and the Navy, um, the Australian and also particularly the British Navy, was, was there to, to carry a lot of the load in terms of defending that sort of island barrier. Obviously, in World War II, as we all know, um, Japan invaded, um, and that necessitated a, a large land campaign, which sort of shifted the way we thought about PNG to a certain degree. But uh, come the end of the war, we uh, we won. Um, surprise, surprise. And um, PNG, uh, the, the forces in PNG were, were, were demobilised, sent back to Australia, um, and they're just uh, you know, a collection of small bases and troops left over doing things like guarding POWs in, on, on Manus Island. But with the, with the Cold War and the, the rise of the Soviet Union, and, and in particular China, um, in Australia's case, there was a sense that PNG was undefended in, in the late 40s and early 1950s. And in, in 1949, uh, Robert Menzies, the Prime Minister, was forced to admit that there were no combat forces based permanently in PNG. Um, and indeed, this was part of a wider sort of uh, concern about Australia's defence. There were only, in 1950, I think, 1,000 trained uh, combat soldiers based in Australia at the time. 
So there were two avenues in which the Australian government uh, addressed this. One was to raise uh, the Papua New Guinea Volunteer Rifles, a uh, reserve unit, and also the Pacific Islands Regiment, a, a regular force made up of Papua New Guineans. That was one avenue. And the other one was um, the, the, the Navy presence on Manus Island. Uh, PIR covered the defensive aspect. Um, it was meant as a tripwire. And then Manus Island was both defensive in, in, in that it was a, a forward operating base, but also offensive in the sense that it... it could tie into Australia's lines of communication. Now, um, that's the way we, we saw of PNG in the 1950s, um, and very much this fitted into a broader uh, Australian sense of where we stood strategically, um, particularly in relation to somewhere like Malaya, which, despite its fall in World War II, was still considered rather important to Australia's defence in the 1950s. Um, and then comes along confrontation in 1962 or thereabouts, and this is when Indonesia... Um, as the name suggests, has, has its um, sort of uh, plays out its antipathy towards um, Malaya and Malaysia in Borneo and, and, and on the Malayan Peninsula, but also against Australia and, and Britain more generally. And so, given that they have taken over West Papua in 1962, um, this causes a lot of strategic concern for Australia. And indeed, it's the first time and the only time that Australia has shared a land border with a potentially hostile country and and you know you can imagine the sort of the problems this this raises in terms of australia's defense and so um a lot of australia's uh well most of australia's defense commitment to png is uh, orientated towards defending the border and and, and the, the sea lanes of um a, a, of advance um and this leads to a sort of significant expansion of uh, pacific islands regiment and also of the naval component at manus now, the sort of the third theme of, of, of how we see PNG in a strategic sense is, is the run down to independence. So in 1966, confrontation ends with the signing of a treaty in Bangkok. Um, and at the same time, that same year, Cabinet meets for the first time to talk about the way in which we might start to decolonise uh, in PNG. Now, Cabinet actually decides to not make a decision um, and leave it till later. But, but nonetheless, the writing's on the wall by this point. And so, very much, we start to wind down our defence presence in in, in PNG. The, the the threat from from Indonesia has passed, with the rise of sort of longer range weapons. The idea of PNG being a barrier sort of loses its credence, and and the strategic basis paper turns uh, its description from PNG from vital to just significant. Which you know, in the in the word in, in sort of the land of those who sort of pour over the language in white papers, this is this is quite important. Um, and so by 1970, um, the Australian government starts to make decisions um, that the PNG will be decolonised in the next four or five years. Uh, and, and there starts to become the shift from PNG as a barrier to, to, to handing over a defence force as, as part of the wider decolonisation of PNG. So that's uh, the strategic, our strategic thinking when it comes to PNG in a nutshell. Um, basically, we see it as a barrier until we decide that um, we need to decolonise. Thanks, Tristan. That does sound quite complex. Yeah. Um, Jerry and Viv, um, you both served at Tarangau uh, during the 60s. Um, can you share some of the history of what was going on there and how were you preparing for independence uh, during your time there? Um, I first saw Tarangau in 1956 uh, mm -hmm. as a midshipman when I went there in the Swan, but that was just a visit. I went back in 63 uh, and that was after Tarangau had substantially reduced its role um, and, its, uh, uh, and reduced the, the extent of Australian involvement. There were only seven officers on the base and I guess about 90 Australian sailors, yeah. plus the PNG division that was then 100 or so local uh, guys in uniform, and we had about another 300 or 350 uh, locally engaged personnel, mainly from off Manus Island, uh, who helped to run the base. Uh, we were in a tropical environment where everything grew like mad, so a lot of them spent their time slashing uh, grass and stuff like <laughs> that. Um, there was an atmosphere in 1963 of um, a genuine outpost of, of the Australian um, 
mini empire, if you like. Um, it was uh, a sleepy atmosphere. We had um, a ship from south about every two months with uh, supplies and stores, victuals, uh, stuff to pe keep people alive. Um, we had a plane about two or three times a week uh, that would bring in just people. Uh, but generally, there was nothing much going on. Occasionally, we had ship visits. Uh, some came to take fuel, uh, and we had a major fuel installation there, and that was about all. But in 1963, uh, let me see, confrontation was uh, about to rear its ugly head, and Marnus began to play a role as um, a staging post for people going in that direction. Mostly the minesweepers would come through Marnus for fueling, rest R&R, &R, uh, and then on to whatever they had to do in the, uh, in the Ma uh, Malaysian uh, confrontation period. Um, I think I might leave it at that and let, give, uh, let uh, Viv give his, recommend his remembrance as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jerry. Okay. I relieved Jerry as XO beginning of 72. By that stage, um, Manus had developed considerably um, with the arrival of the patrol boat base, uh, patrol boats, and mm -hmm. the creation of the, the new PNG sailors. Um, the, the original PNG uh, sailors basically spoke pidgin and uh, were now used just to uh, run the small boats around the place and, and help run the, the base. The new sailors um, had a high school education. The um, lingua franca was English and the patrol boats were run as RAN ships, little like RAN ships. Um, and uh, the whole organisation was, was starting to thrive. Um, we had a, a very good training system going there for young recruits coming in uh, and also as potential officers. So we'd already started the uh, process of training young officers and the first uh, of those officers were now serving in the, in the patrol boats. Um, at the same time, 72, 73, uh, we were proceeding towards self-government um, and that was, um, everybody was conscious of that. But the um, Tarangau was still being run as an RAN base and the ships were still being run as RAN ships. Sorry, Jerry, you got something there. Um, I, I think the, the uh, people watching this might be a bit confused because I, I was talking about 63, Viv was talking about 1972. I didn't stay there for nine years. <laughs> Um, I had a couple of couple of years in 1963, and then I came back later in in 1970 yeah. uh, to clarify that. Um, Did yeah. you, apart from you know, uh, you know fueling the ships that were coming through and you know and training up the PNG uh, sailors, was there anything else that you know Australia was doing out there with you know surveying or mine clearance or those sorts of things? Viv? Um, yes, um, of course there'd been a lot of mines laid during the war. And um, uh, in the 1960s, uh, the what was then our new mine uh, sweeping squadron came up to clear mines uh, around the uh, New England area and things, New Britain area. Uh, and then uh, the need to survey the, the waters around there became very important as part of the you know, Australian station. And um, surveying started quite in earnest with Paluma at first and then uh, Moresby came later. So um, it was quite a lot of activity going on. And I think even today the RAN is still responsible for the, for the surveying mm. of, of PNG waters. Tristan, uh, chopping back to yourself, um, how did the naval element compare to the size of the, the Australian Army and the Australian Air Force element that was based in PNG? Yeah, my, my favourite fact 
that I always tell everyone about the army in PNG is that in 1972, so just before um, the PNGDF was formed, uh, this Papua New Guineans made up one in almost one in ten um, of the Australian regular army soldiers, um, which which gives a sense of how large the force was. I mean, it, at the height of Vietnam period, there were uh, nine Australian battalions and then two um, PIR battalions as well. But, but that comes later. Um, it, initially, the, the PIR was made up of one battalion, about 600 soldiers, um, mainly Papua New Guinean with Australian officers, um, and its role was very much as a light force, um, very much as a tripwire, still considered to be, have a similar role to um, its wartime role, which was that, you know, as an auxiliary to Australian forces. Um, as I mentioned, the, the army expands quite a great deal um, around between 64 and 65 um, in response to confrontation. So um, PNG command um, is created in 1965 and a second battalion of the PIR is created um, and is sort of equipped more in line with, with regular Australian army battalions with heavy weapons and the like, and there's engineers and signalers and those sorts of things. To give you a sense of the size, um, in 1965 there were 1,400 soldiers in um, PNG command. By 1969, there was 2,400, and by 1972, there was 2,700. Um, so, so quite a significant um, sort of contribution. Something that really strikes me listening to you all is the way in which Army was very much focused on the security of PNG itself, whereas Navy was very much, I mean, while there was, was an element of that, it was more outwardly focused because the PNG division fit into wider Navy um, sort of operations. Um, whereas, whereas, whereas the PIR was, for a whole variety of reasons, only supposed to fight in PNG. Um, now, we can't forget the Air Force, of course. Um, they, they weren't based permanently in PNG. They, they would um, task aircraft as necessary. Um, they were profoundly important in moving troops around um, PNG. Uh, if you looked at a map, you, you know you can't drive many places. Um, so uh, from about 1965, there's two Caribou transports permanently based in Port Mosby, um, transporting troops and supplies. Uh, but it was only in, uh, uh, around 1973-74 that ground crew and, and pilots started to be trained for, for the PNG D Defence Force. And these were, were going to be flying DC-3s. Um, I sort of end on a, on a note uh, talking about the size and, of Army and Air Force and indeed Navy in PNG. It is very much the, the 1965 to 1970 period that really lays the foundation in terms of the structure of the PNGDF, while we tend to think of that sort of quick run-up to independence um, from 1970. You can see the, the, um, the foundations of what would become the PNGDF from about 1963. You've got the patrol boats for the, for the maritime element, you've got the two battalions in the army, and then you've got sort of a handful of planes for logistics based in based around the, the territory. So that, that's how it compares. N Navy very much more, uh, while slightly smaller, fit into a much broader um, sort of Navy structure. Thanks. Brian, you spent uh, nearly four years there in, at Tarangau as, uh, as a medical officer. Um, what was it like there? And you know, what was the, the hospital like? And you're looking after families and you've got, you're training some of the PNG personnel as well. What was it actually like during that time? We arrived in November 63, arrived after a two day trip from Brisbane. And this was the, the day that JFK was murdered or was assassinated. We arrived, um, in a DC-3 with seating along the sides with, I think we were the only Australians on board apart from the crew. The uh, native women were suckling piglets, which my wife was quite amazed at, and myself. And uh, we finally arrived, having stayed overnight in Lay on the way. Now, Manus at that, or Tarangar at that stage, had a complement, I think, of six officers, eight when Banks was alongside. Uh, Noik was Max Peachy, who retired a year or two later. Now, Max was a very relaxed sort of person, and the base itself was relaxed. We had 
a complement, I think, of about 50 or 60 RAN people. The PNG division varied between uh, 70 or 69 and about 130 during the time that I was there. And then later it expanded to about 260. Of the six officers who were there, there was an engineer, there was uh, the, the captain and the XO, um, there was myself, there was um, somebody looking after the PNG division, and that was about it. The captain secretary at that stage was not a commissioned officer, that happened later, and the, the whole establishment grew. However, in 1963, there was talk in Australia about whether Manus should be decommissioned altogether. And it wasn't until December 64 that Prime Minister Menzies announced that Australia was going to build 15 patrol boats, five of which would be based on Manus. So Tarangau was in effect given a new lease of life at that stage. The, uh, as SMO there, I had a staff of three RAN personnel, three Papua New Guinea division people, and about 10 doctor boys from the labour line. Um, this staff had been fairly static, and it, they'd, apart from the RAN personnel who changed, the rest, the PNG and the Labor Line personnel were there for quite a long time. Um, I had a civilian nursing sister initially. Later, the Navy provided nursing sisters, but not, not at the start. Um, in general, it was an enjoyable, relaxed sort of place. We, uh, we looked after the native population, anybody who came along. We were the backstop for the Lorengau Hospital, where most of the time there was either a Fiji-trained medical assistant or a nursing sister. So anything that uh, was beyond their capabilities would be transferred across to us. We looked after people from all over the island in emergencies and they would be transported in by canoe from the nearest mission. Some of them didn't make it. So I had an enjoyable four years there. The place did grow while we were there after 1964. And so the Australian personnel had their families there as well? Yes, there were probably about uh, about 40 odd families from this from Australia and uh, socially these would get together. Um, we had various things happening in the chiefs the chiefs mess would run fancy dress parties and similar things for the children. Um, so. yep. uh, Jerry Bryan's mentioned uh, HMAS Banks there briefly, and I, th I think you may have been the CO at, at one stage. Um, so uh, what was Banks doing there? I think it was the first time that an RAN ship had been actually sent to that area after World War II. Yeah, I think Banks was the first uh, commissioned ship to be based on Marnus uh, since World War II days. Well, of course, uh, there were none in the World War II days either based on Marnus. They were based in other places mostly. Um, banks had a specific role to play on in the coast watching organisation that mm. you haven't mentioned so far, but I guess we'll be exploring mm. later in this session mm. or another session. Um, and the coast watchers were all basically civilian personnel, although some of them were members of the Royal Australian Naval Volunteer Reserve. They held commissions. Um, it was a. Uh, it descended from the wartime organisation, mm -hmm. which has been well recorded in history. Uh, 
firstly by its founder, Eric Felt. Uh, it was a naval-run organisation that uh, embodied Army and Air Force personnel as well. Uh, but they stayed behind in uh, PNG after the Japanese occupied parts of it and uh, relayed intelligence of Japanese operations and also assisted with search and rescue for downed pilots and down uh, and and shipwreck mariners as well, mm. of, of which there were quite a lot. And so this organisation continued on after yes. the war? it continued on after the war. They were unpaid volunteer people, but we provided them where they needed it with radios. Mm. Some of them were administration officials, uh, district commissioners, patrol officers mm. uh, and, uh, and the like. Um, but most of the others were involved in commercial operations, mainly um, planters on plantations. So they were in remote sorts. If you looked at the map, all the significant outlying islands had a coast watcher on them. He might have had a, he usually had a small coconut plantation. Some of them were growing co uh, um, cocoa as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to try and visit each of those stations, of which there were about I think 80 or 90 spread through PNG and the Solomon Islands. And that's where Banks came in. She was that conduit. To she, we we travelled around. We had a radio electrical mechanic on board and checked their radios. Uh, I or another officer would uh, go through their um, publications, their restricted publications, uh, their code books and so on, um, and just generally maintain contact and keep them feeling that they were valued, which they certainly were. A mm. uh, lot of interesting characters. Some of them were the, uh, uh, had been there in wartime as well. Okay. And you were also training some of the PNG sailors on board banks as well? Um, I, I, wouldn't like, uh, I wouldn't like to say we really trained them. They came to us as trained personnel. Oh. They, they received sea experience and they probably learned a lot on the job. But we didn't set out to do any formal training of, of P and G personnel. Mm. Yeah. Um, you all had your families living there, and Brian's alluded to it. Uh, I think you know, it, it was a, not so much a, a harsh posting, but how did your families cope with you know being away from Australia? Well, in, in if you're directing the question to me, I didn't have a family the first time I was there yeah. in Banks. Uh, I had a family um, the second time yeah. when I was there um, in the patrol boats um, and it, the extent of my family was a wife for most yeah. of the time, although she did, I'm happy to say, give birth um, and my daughter was born, born on Marmus. Um, it's a process of adjustment but uh, Brian has described how people made their own entertainment. Uh, mm. There was generally um, a, a lot of um, a lot of parties went on, mm. but they weren't <laughs> concentrated just on booze. Mm. Uh, I remember in the 60s, uh, if you went out to a party, uh, it it wasn't a stand around and talk party. It usually within an hour were playing charades. And we played charades <laughs> at an Olympic level. It, it was uh, very high quality. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, um, so th uh, that plus the, uh, the availability of uh, foodstuffs and so on, of course, was um, not what you'd expect from a Woolies outlet. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to keep lettuces and so on fresh for a long period. We didn't get a lot of our vegetables from locally uh, because they simply weren't available on, uh, on Manus Island itself. Some of the, one of the outlying islands, Low, used to send, uh, used to sell some vegetables. They actually went into uh, the mission on Low Island, uh, quite some distance away, uh, grew vegetables specifically for the base and they used to send a canoe in mm. with a load of vegetables that we bought. It was, a, it was a contribution to the local economy. But that was sold through the naval uh, supply system. Yeah. They sold them to the base and the base sold them to the, the families. Yeah. Mm. If you've got something to add there. Yes, we're, after Jerry had gone, uh, we were fortunate that the RAAF 
started to fly in fresh vegetables from the highlands. Um, each Thursday a caribou would arrive, um, which improved our rationing completely, <laughs> utterly, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the time when Jerry was talking about. Yeah. Brian, I'll just uh, add live here that was there any sort of medical issues with this lack of um, you know, vegetables you know, on a regular basis? Well, no. We had our stores came through the canteen with uh, the ship arriving every couple of months. Uh, we would have fresh veggies from the highlands would come down twice a week. And these would be distributed on a, an ad hoc basis. You never knew what you were getting, but uh, you would always have something. The plantation on Low Island would provide more like native vegetables, things like cow cow and, uh, and that kind of thing. Whereas our fresh veggies actually came from the highlands. And this, this was right back early in the piece from 1963. So uh, I tried growing things, but the, mm. the steaks I put in grew better than the tomatoes. <laughs> Viv, uh, you were the XO. So what was it like you know, working with uh, you know, the different rank levels within the RAN? And were there any differences between the, the PNG personnel and the locals? Yeah, what were some of the issues going on at that time? Um, one of the issues was that there were a number of the RN sailors were there married unaccompanied. Uh, so they were, and they didn't have many or any uh, female company. Um, so that's always a, a potential problem. Uh, I never saw any really conflict between RN sailors and PNG sailors. Um, the impression I had was the PNG sailors, uh, and I think this is a, uh, a credit to the RAN personnel all the way through from the development, was that they were proud of being RAN sailors. Mm. And their great fear was being turned into the PIR. Um, remember that um, they were on RAN rations, mm -hmm. and they were quite aware of the PIR's rations were quite different. And um, there, I think they had a far higher opinion of not only the RAN sailors, but the whole of the RAN community at, at Manus than they, they did of the PIR soldiers. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I assume, and I'll direct to, yeah, first year to you, Jerry, and then to Viv, because uh, you were there at different times. Um, I think that the pay scale, though, was, was different. So the RN sailors were on one pay scale and then the PNG sailors were going to be on another. And then later in the 60s, when the group pay system was brought in, I think there was some difficulty there with uh, the PNG sailors then being on a lower pay scale than the RN sailors. Could you care to comment on that? Uh, I've, I've heard that there was... Uh trouble on that score, uh, I saw the word riot mentioned in, in one account that I read. Uh, it, it was something that happened before my time. I vaguely remember hearing about it, but after I got there and in, in my second visit in, in early 1970, uh, I didn't see any sign of problems on that score at all. Uh, so if there had been trouble, it happened before I got there. Hmm. Mm. Yes, I, I didn't uh, notice. I think the PNG sailors realised that uh, you know they couldn't be paid at the at the same level as Australians uh, because they were going towards independence. Um, remembering going back to the group pay system, that there was a lot of trouble within the RAN when it was mm -hmm. introduced. Uh, stokers walking off Melbourne and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it it wasn't all that well introduced throughout, so uh, <laughs> causing problems in Manus wasn't anything new to the <laughs> RAN. <laughs> Gentlemen, thanks for this. I'll just get you to, to uh, go through. Uh, Jerry, is there any last comments you'd like to make about your, your time in, in Manus and working with the, with the PNG people? Yeah, thinking back on what's been talked about, uh, um, I think a couple of times the prospect of independence was mentioned. Now, um, 
I'm not sure that I, I can speak for the others, but my view of this is that in the, in the 60s, in the early 60s when I was there, there was never any serious talk about independence for PNG. It was recognised that it was something that would happen in the future. Uh, it first came up, it first really came onto the front page, onto the front burner, uh, when Gough Whitlam mm. uh, and uh, Kim Beasley's father, old Kim, and um, the guy who eventually became Governor General um, when Bill, he drove his dog. Bill Hayden. Mm. Bill Hayden came up. And Gough made his announcement while he was in country as leader of the opposition that when he was elected Prime Minister, uh, New Guinea would receive prime, uh, uh, independence in 1975. Now that was banner headlines across the country, uh, across Australia and across PNG. And it was largely, of course, delivered. Gough be became Prime Minister and set in train the acquisition of independence for PNG, though it happened after he left. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to put that in perspective. There was uh, independence for PNG came on the scene quite rapidly, mm -hmm. like a tsunami. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I would ag agree with that. Um, when I arrived in '72, as I said, it was very much an RAN base, but suddenly, um, over the next 18 months, this rapid move towards first self-government and then uh, independence occurred, and uh, it. it caught a number of people off guard, really. Yeah. Brian, during my time there, there was a visit from United Nations people who recommended independence. Now, they were mostly, um, mostly people from African countries mm. where their own independence struggles had not really gone all that well. And, but this was their recommendation which uh, I felt was far too early. Tristan, you've done extensive research into uh, the, the creation of the PNGDF, obviously through the, the 50s and 60s and then into the 70s, mm. and there's the Army, Navy and Air Force components. Um, did you uncover anything interesting uh, other than what you've already said about what the RAN was doing in PNG at this time? Well, sort of... Taking the cue from, from the others who've talked about independence, I think there's an interesting episode, and I can't claim to have discovered this, um, in which um, there was a, a, a media storm over two Papua New Guinean cadets who were serving in HMAS Sydney uh, when it visited Vietnam as part of its role in, in, in transporting troops and supplies there. Um, and there was a storm because um, Papua New Guineans were not allowed to uh, travel to war zones. Um, they were expected to defend PNG but, but not um, fight in Australia's, Australia's wars, which I think very much speaks to the sort of dual identity that, that Papua New Guinean soldiers, sailors and, and, and to us extent airmen had during this period. On the one hand, there was always a sense that PNG might become independent. Um, as everyone said, it, it, it came quite quickly, the sort of rundown to independence, but there was always a, in, in the background of people's minds. Um, a sense that it might become its own nation. But at the same time, structurally, it's very much set up in such a way that Papua New Guineans were an integral part of the Australian Armed Forces. Um, they, 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 as this case showed, they, they served on Australian ships wherever those ships might go. Um, so I think that's that's a really sort of interesting and important thing to keep in mind, this, this idea that while Papua New, we look at Papua New Guinea today and think, oh, well, that's an independent nation, but that wasn't a given. I mean, in many ways, the territory of Papua, and, and, um, in particular, was considered to be similar to the ACT or the Northern Territory. Um, it was only in the, the late 60s and 1970s that, that the form of, of an independent nation state um, sort of was, was cemented. Um, so I suppose that's the sort of the interesting point I'll leave, well, I'll leave you with is that sense that Papua New Guineans were very much um, members of the Australian Armed Forces, albeit not paid the same or necessarily treated the same as, as Australian um, service personnel, but nonetheless doing the equal jobs um, and, and seen as uh, the same as any other sailors or soldiers. Thanks, Tristan.
Um, thanks, Brian. Thanks, thanks, Viv. Thanks, Jerry, um, for your time today and your experiences uh, in what's well, not quite ancient history now, but it's certainly way uh, something that very few Australians are quite aware of. Um, sadly, that's all we have time for today. My thanks to you gentlemen for joining us and thank you Tristan for joining us from Brisbane uh, and you. offering your insights and thank you for joining us. We look forward to your company for the next episode. Bye for now.